So I have the folks in the waiting room uh, been let in at this point? Yep, everyone's in. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to first uh, welcome everybody to our uh, Chemical and Biological Engineering Winter Town Hall. Uh, trust me, it is a winter town hall. For those who haven't been in or about Wisconsin or the Midwest in the past week, uh, this is that one week a year that we all dread. Uh, so uh, this will this will hopefully uh, be a harbinger of things to come in terms of a warming trend here with the uh, with the town hall meeting. Um, just as an introduction for those of you who may not know, um, I'm Eric Schuster. I'm the uh, department chair of chemical and biological engineering. And I wanted to welcome a lot of new faces that I see in the audience and also many uh, town hall returnees. Um, our format for today uh, will be for me to uh, give you some brief department updates, give you sort of some status uh, updates with a, a variety of exciting departmental happenings. Um, then we're gonna be following that with a presentation from a special guest. Uh, and I will ask that, uh, we save the questions uh, to the end. So I know some of you have sub, uh, submitted questions with your registration. Uh, and then also if questions come up during uh, my presentation or, or that uh, uh, that follows, you can just enter those in the chat and uh, Mike Holland uh, will sort of collate those and, and we'll ask and answer them uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, I'd like to start first with some uh, exciting faculty news updates, uh, and, and there is a, a variety of them here, um, and it's always exciting to see uh, and remind people of the absolutely world-class faculty that we have in our department. Um, the first uh, person I'd like to mention is Professor Zavala. So Victor uh, received a Vilas Mid-Career Award. Uh, these are UW-Madison campus local awards, but extremely competitive uh, and, and uh, are awarded to uh, faculty all throughout the campus. So this is a, a really representative of uh, the high impact work that Victor uh, is doing. Uh, Stiliana uh, received uh, a, an external award from the International Society of Global Optimization. She was named uh, Young Investigator uh, this past summer. Uh, so she is uh, uh, doing great things uh, in the arena of circular economy. Uh, and sort of birth to death of, of chemicals and products. Uh, you'll see in the middle, uh, we have uh, two assistant professors, uh, Rosie Sersansky, whom is our special guest, by the way, uh, and Whitney Liu, who were each named as Conway assistant professors. So these professorships supply Rosie and Whitney uh, with extra support, some discretionary support to really uh, help them in the early stages of their career. Uh, they can start new research projects. They can bring on uh, paid undergraduate researchers. They may uh, hire in a new laboratory assistant, get a new piece of equipment. Those sorts of things are supported by these assistant professorships. I'll also point out uh, that Rosie was recently selected as one of the 35 under 35. So uh, this is a really exciting award that recognizes her role in materials research. Uh, so these are the top 35 faculty across uh, the United States, or probably the world, uh, that are under the age of 35. So uh, moving down uh, one set here, Brian Flegger uh, received a Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professorship. So much like uh, Victor's Mid-Career Award, this is a UW-Madison local award. That's really the top award you can receive as a faculty member in terms of distinguishing your research, your service, and your teaching. So it's it's really a collective award for people who excel in, in all areas of, of faculty contribution. And then I will point out uh, that a new assistant professor, Quentin Dudley, uh, joined us just a couple weeks ago uh, in the 1st of January. And Quentin is bringing a new set of tools to the biological side of the department where he's gonna be using metabolic engineering with plants uh, to produce value-added chemicals and medicines. So he couldn't, he couldn't fall into a better environment than that that we have at UW-Madison in terms of having departments across the university like botany, uh, plant pathology, and things like that where he can really uh, achieve the high-impact research that he uh, uh, sets out to do. 
And I'll point out, I have this in parentheses, that brings us to 20 full-time faculty. And why am I excited about that? Because that's the highest number of faculty that we've had in our department since I started in 2001. And so what's really exciting about this, we can train more students, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. We can provide more designer electives to give more well-rounded uh, graduates as they exit the department. And really, if you compare departments, uh, those that are highly ranked tend to have larger faculty sizes. So we're really excited about our departmental growth uh, and we continue to look to grow in the coming, in the coming years. Um, so how about the undergraduate program? So we have about 500 total undergraduates in the program. So this is roughly 120 undergraduates uh, per year. Uh, we've been holding fairly steady in terms of our demand and our enrollment, uh, which is a good thing because as we talk to our peers across the country, they're seeing uh, some decline in interest in chemical engineering. Uh, this tends to be cyclical, uh, but we still have a strong demand. And with some of the new facilities I'll show you coming uh, later in the presentation, I think we're going to continue to have that demand uh, as we can really sell a top-notch uh, program. Uh, so most undergraduates, they graduate uh, in May, but we do have a cohort usually that graduates in December. Uh, so we had 36 undergraduates graduate uh, this past December. Uh, Kate Dalkey, who's our outstanding teaching faculty, uh, gave the remarks and really reflected on on the student's time as an undergraduate uh, uh, in the department. And so that was uh, just this past December. And, and then we look to usually have uh, 80 to 100 graduates then uh, coming up in May in the spring. Uh, graduate student news. Uh, I think a couple of things I'd like to emphasize here. Our graduate students are outstanding, not only in the research laboratories, but as instructors in the classroom. And they really enhance the experience of our undergraduates that come through our program. Um, part of how we recognize those top teaching assistants um, is that the undergraduates themselves vote for the top teaching assistants and they receive so-called Ragus Awards. So Professor Ragus was a pioneer in chemical engineering undergraduate education and friends of Professor Ragus started a scholarship fund that allows top teaching assistants to be recognized. So just to give you an idea, this past fall, we recognized uh, Seth uh, and Matt and Evangelos who are standing on the stairs in the upper right image. Uh, and, and Nate Blaylock wasn't able to be there for the presentation, uh, but these are awards that are given out during our annual graduate student seminar. And they're very prestigious for these graduate students. In the bottom image, you see a lot of people. Uh, this is uh, our most recent set of graduate students. Um, in fact, 34 of them uh, started this past fall. So it's an all-time high in terms of the number of graduate students that we've brought into the program. Uh, and these, these folks are going to do great things. And they're also re representing the growth in our program, not only at the faculty level, but also the research and training level uh, of the graduate students. So we're very happy to have them here and create a very vibrant graduate student program. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, uh, if you followed any of our newsletters or, or followed us on LinkedIn or any of the other social media platforms, uh, we've been undergoing some really significant uh, and exciting renovations here in the department. Uh, last October, so October 2023, we embarked on a huge renovation project, which involved redoing the entire instructional laboratories or known to many of you as summer laboratory uh, and a large scale renovation of the bioengineering research laboratory. Because of the economies of scale, the, the uh, contractors were able to do both of them si simultaneously. Um, what I'd like to show you today is, is uh, where we're at. And you'll see that we've made a substantial progress and much of the work has been done. So what I'm showing in the images here, this is actually the new summer lab space. So you can see this uh, uh, convertible bench work. It allows us really to reconfigure on demand. Um, in, the, in the bottom uh, image, in the bottom right, what I'm showing you are the, the flow rigs for the Transport Phenomena Lab. So this past fall, we are already fully in session in educating students in less than a year uh, in this renovated basement space. 
And you may have noticed it's a little bit lighter in here than you might have been accustomed to if you were uh, ever in the downstairs uh, space uh, prior to 2023, uh, myself included. Uh, it's light. So that's natural light coming through uh, uh, windows uh, that are in, in this space and then a much improved uh, cleaning up of the space uh, so that it's actually a bright and welcoming space. Across the hallway is new space acquired by the department as part of this renovation. That's the so-called pilot plant space. So this is a two-story space uh, that's nearing completion. Uh, what I'm showing in the upper left image is you'll see these windows here. This is looking out over Camp Randall. Okay, so this is a space that we never had as chemical engineering department before um, that really allows all this natural light to come in. More excitingly, I think, is every Saturday, tens of thousands of people walk by and fall for the football game, and what are they doing? They're looking into the space saying, what goes on there? And so we have good chemical engineering branding in there, and you'll be able to really see what, what chemical engineers do. In the bottom right-hand um, image, what I'm showing is a different view of the pilot plant space. And I'm just gonna focus on this way in the background here. This is an interesting addition as well. This is our fermentation lab that we've also added to the instructional laboratories. So this is a food grade fermentation laboratory. Uh, if you zoom in, you might see something called a Braumeister. So uh, we had an, uh, an alum who was uh, very into brewing and so donated a lot of high-end pilot plant type brewing equipment uh, for our students to get into this laboratory and go through the chemical engineering of brewing, food preparation, chromatography, uh, and different types of experimental systems. So zoomed out now, in the top right, this is what it was supposed to look like in terms of the architect's uh, renderings. And you can now see what it looks like in this large photo in the middle. You'll see it's two stories tall, as I mentioned. You'll see the windows in the background. You'll also see ladders. You'll see some uh, steel uh, structure in there. And so we are actually building or fabricating each of the large process units at this time. And so this one here on the bottom right, you're just basically zooming in. Uh, you're seeing the, the platform that's holding the distillation column. You might see the still down here right on the bottom, and then the trays will be installed uh, as we speak. Actually, they're going in uh, today and in the coming weeks. So we're very excited to have this expanded space separate from our classical summer lab space where we could really uh, build out and space the equipment, have full-size equipment or you know, pilot plant size equipment that the students can really get around, see what's happening, take samples, monitor the equipment uh, in real time. As I mentioned, this was part of a joint uh, construction project. Another is a 6,000 square foot bioengineering research laboratory that now houses, uh, currently houses four, will house five faculty uh, in the department and about 45 students. Uh, this was uh, generously supported by uh, the Blemke family. So you can see Dwayne and Dorothy Blemke, great friends of the department here uh, as part of our ribbon cutting ceremony. You'll also see a head missing in this ribbon cutting uh, uh, thing. Uh, and that's, that's me. So apparently I'm already being wiped out from all the images of the department. And on the right-hand side, uh, we went through the space to give a tour. You'll see, uh, you know, it's really clean. It's really open. Um, and in order to get there, uh, we had the neat opportunity to put a camera in and do some time lapse of the actual construction process. And I just wanted to give you an idea where we started and where we ended up. Um, so right here, I'm just going to pause it just for a second. What you see in the middle is a, is a, was a public hallway. On the right-hand side, we had very small 400 square foot modules that were, were not all interconnected. So students would actually do an experiment in one lab and have to walk out into the public hallway and carry their experiment into an adjacent lab. So that obviously has safety considerations in, in, in addition to inconvenience. And then there were small cubicle offices on the left-hand side. The important note here is this is about 1500 square foot of hallway space. And so uh, what we ended up doing was closing off both ends of the hallway. And as you'll see during the construction here, these walls will be 
completely eliminated. And it opens up a large open concept space. That large open concept space allows multiple groups to interact, interact very collaboratively. It allows us to share equipment and really leverage resources. Um, and it just uh, is, is, turns out to be uh, a great space. So here they're putting in all the duct work, all of the utilities are coming in on the ceiling and flexible lines so that we can reconfigure to our heart's content within this large laboratory space. Uh, all the fume hoods and biosafety cabinets are on the right-hand side in those smaller cubicles that you might see. Uh, and pretty soon we'll see the casework come in. Uh, the camera was above the ceiling. You'll see it has to be dropped below the ceiling here momentarily. And then now the casework will come in after the floor refinishing. And you'll end up basically where we where we left off, where we we're taking the Blemke family through on their tour of the uninhabited space. And we'll see these uh, finish up real quick here. All right, so this is what it looks like at the end. And literally that afternoon of the ribbon cutting ceremony, you went back in here, this is what it looks like. So if you don't think the students were excited to get in the space, uh, here's the evidence. This is how quickly they were queued up to get in there and start using the space. So an excellent addition uh, to the department. So there are always project opportunities uh, available uh, if you're so inclined. Yes, re relative to the uh, instructional laboratories, there are still naming opportunities and feel free to reach out to Mike Holland uh, our development director, uh, if you're interested in learning more. So now I'll switch over to our, our guest of honor, uh, Rosie Sersonsky. So Rosie joined us uh, as an assistant professor last January, January 2023. She received her bachelor's degree in material science and engineering at the University of Connecticut. She then moved on to get a PhD in macromolecular science and engineering at the University of Michigan with Sharon Glotzer. And then she went on to do a postdoctoral research stint at EPFL, where she was part of the computational science and modeling program there. And I'll let Rosie tell you more about her research, but she's really doing great things, trying to connect molecular and material structure for a variety of different applications. And so Rosie, I'll turn the floor over to you now. So you can load up your presentation and we'll go from there. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, so hi, I'm Rose or Rosie Sersonsky, and my group deals a lot with how we can use concepts of machine learning for multi-scale chemical problems. And as um, Eric just told you, um, I did my bachelor's in material science and engineering with a concentration in computer science at the University of Connecticut in 2014. I then went on to get a PhD in macromolecular science and engineering, where my thesis dealt with designing different nanoparticles for the self-assembly of novel materials. And then I spent three years as a postdoctoral researcher in Switzerland, focused on machine learning representations and models for interpretability and molecular design. A little bit about me. Um, I'm a big runner. So I, this is my most recent half marathon where you can see I had to put a lot of tape on my knees because they're not as good as they used to be. Um, I also enjoy rock climbing. So this is me out in Switzerland on the side of a, of a cliff. And to offset these activities, I like to bake. Um, so as you can imagine, these are all very mutually compatible things. Um, otherwise, I spent a lot of time, I have two cats named uh, Leonard, uh, Leonard and Matilda, and then on the bottom is me with my family. My mom there is a fifth grade teacher, my older sister is an English professor, my younger sister is a gynecologist, and my brother is a campaign manager. So that's us with our families this last Christmas. Outside of my research work, I also do a lot fiercely in support of gender equity within our field. So this is a paper that I put out earlier last year that really looked and analyzed the data of differential um, 
statistics for women in computational materials research, looking at the rate at which we graduate them, the rate at which they are promoted, funded, and all of the different uh, advice that we have in terms to uh, lessen that gap. So for example, one of the things that we looked at here was the rate of um, female graduates in chemical engineering over the past 30 years and how we haven't seen much meaningful change in the percentage of the chemical engineering classes that are women. And so a lot of what I think about in terms of my PI ship is ways in which we can support and encourage more people from underrepresented groups to uh, pursue and feel at home within chemical engineering. So my lab was established in 2023. So we're currently working on building an awesome team of researchers. This is our most recent uh, group retreat where we all went out to hike together and then spent uh, a couple hours at a uh, classic Wisconsin supper club eating food and getting to know each other. I find these really important aspects of um, putting together a group culture so that they know that they can support and rely on each other. Currently, the lab consists of five graduate students, Charles Carroll, Christian Jorgensen, Hui Guang Lim, uh, Arthur Lin, and Saswak Nayak, as well as a large cohort of undergraduate researchers. These are just a couple of them. So uh, most recently, we've had Yong Chul Cho, Natalie Hooven, Henry Lee, Lucas Ortengren, and Caleb Youngworth. And I'm really excited to announce that Yong Chul Cho and Henry Lee have just been accepted into really a some of our peer institutions for PhDs in chemical engineering. And Natalie Hooven is going to, who is a third year undergraduate researcher is starting writing her first paper and is going to be presenting on that at the American Physical Society in March. So truly I am blessed to have excellent, excellent students. And I've really enjoyed setting up the lab to work with them. So towards more of what we do, so the question of how can machine learning be used in chemical engineering problems? Well, within the chemical engineering simulation community, one of the biggest challenges is how we represent and simulate multi-scale or hierarchical systems. So sys chemical systems that exhibit motion at many different length scales. So you can think about batteries have atomic and molecular components, as well as much larger components. We have hierarchically assembling DNA materials, metal organic frameworks that are used in different sorts of gas separations or catalysis. They have pieces that are moving at different length scales at every single time. And basically in the simulation community, we have to choose which length scale we uh, simulate with the most accuracy. And it's really hard to encode these different things in simulation all simultaneously, which limits our ability to study these different complex systems computationally, which is often necessary to avoid um, to either do high throughput screening of different sorts of um, compositions to understand different sort of fundamental principles, or to avoid working in systems with real materials where those real materials may be expensive or um, are rare or uh, dangerous to work with in an experiment. So machine learning is a set of mathematical tools that can, among other things, relate arbitrary inputs with hard to compute outputs. And so in our group, machine learning is not necessarily the goal, but one of many sets of tools we use to address these outstanding challenges. So to understand a little bit more of what we do, I like to use this sort of framework of a machine learning workflow. So in different workflows, we start with some sort of chemical data. And this can be experimentally observed or simulated materials or chemical systems. And then we choose how to represent it in our machine learning model. And then we use a set of machine learning models to correlate or understand such data. Now, my group really deals with this middle part right here. So in chemical data, how do we represent it? It is entirely impossible to just feed a machine learning model a chemi chemical molecule. You have to choose how to represent it, whether it's in terms of the chemical formula, which is a textual based representation, different sorts of numerical representations, like where all of the atoms sit in the molecule. There's many different choices that you make, and these choices can range from what we would consider a raw representation, like our Cartesian coordinates and chemical identity, 
to things like smiles and smart. So these are really important fundamental concepts in machine learning for chem informatics because there are text-based ways to represent chemistry, molecular graphs, or symmetry-adapted representations. And so as you go up in this chart, from the more complex representation to the least complex representation, you acquire more complexity in the machine learning model, which means that you require more data and often more computing resources. As you go down, you get more interpretability and physical underpinnings. And so my group really works on how we can create more physical underpinnings to our models, such that we require less data and less model complexity for machine learning architectures. And we do this in the context of several current projects, including how well do machine learn potentials, so that potentials are ways that we simulate different sorts of molecules, extrapolate polymer physics, what does an organic molecule see right before undergoing a molecular hopping event? And so this is work that is funded through the Materials Research Science Engineering Center from NSF. How can we predict crystallization of organ organic drug-like molecules and how does molecular geometry play a role? And how can we represent anisotropic molecules in machine learning models? So I'm going to really uh, go into this last one. So anisotropic molecules are molecules that are not spheres. These show up across the board in different sorts of chemical projects. And so this is work that is done by Arthur Lin, who is a current chemical and biological engineering PhD student, with help from Yong Chol Cho, who is a joint chemical and biological engineering and computer science undergraduate. And so often in our theory-driven studies, we want to group one or more atoms into a theoretical unit or a particle. And so this can be either of necessity, our computers can't handle resolving all of the atoms in a very large system, or because we're trying to ask the importance of these at atomic level information. So in a system where we only allow ourselves to treat everything as a body instead of a molecule, what behavior can we explain? And so what Arthur and Yang Chol have done is that they've shown how we can take a molecular representation like this, like a benzene, a set of benzene molecules, and really just as information rich as possible, represent it as two ellipsoidal bodies in a way that we can extrapolate a lot of information about these systems. So this allows us to represent molecular configurations, including geometry, mutual orientation, and molecular neighborhoods in a way that's compatible with machine learning and characterization. So the real long-term benefit of these sorts of mathematical and fundamental studies is an ability to incorporate ideas of how molecules relate to each other into machine learning models, where the current state of the art can really only tell us how atoms relate to each other. So we're moving our scale one step further in a way that's compatible such that we can understand these mixed scale systems. So researchers in the Sersonsky lab, lab gain valuable and translatable training in state-of-the-art software packages and programming languages. So everyone in my lab becomes proficient in the Python coding languages as well as things like Bash and R. They work with Python packages such as Jupyter, Scikit-Learn, NumPy, Matplotlib, ASC and PyTorch. These are a lot of the really important packages that are used in computational research and data science across the board. So one of the goals of the ways that I train my students is that they can go into the ever-growing field of data science and machine learning for chemical engineering and have the contextual knowledge of chemical engineering fundamentals, as well as the proficiency in these data-centric tools that are becoming even more and more valuable in today's economy. And then finally, students in my lab work with simulation packages such as Quantum Espresso and LAMPS. But we don't only just work with packages, we also develop software ourselves. So I personally am the lead developer in a package called Scikit-Matter, which is the primary Scikit-Learn affiliated package for chemical and materials data. So Scikit-Learn is the biggest um, machine learning package globally right now for the Python language. We also develop packages such as AnySoap and our contributors to the package Chemiscope. So across the board, we really try to lead in excellence in open science, scientific software development so that the students who work in my lab can go on to work in data-centric roles within chemical engineering. So with that, I would like to thank you for listening, and I will be happy to take any questions that you may have.
on me, my group, or the work that we do. Thank you very much, uh, Rosie. I think you can hear the virtual applause at this point. So, <laughs> so at this time, uh, uh, Rosie and myself are happy to field any questions uh, that you may have pre-submitted or, or put on the chat. And Mike, would you mind uh, uh, fielding those uh, questions? Should Absolutely. Slide up, slide up, by the way, or should I leave us to the full... Yeah, I think you can pull the slides down if, if necessary, we can share them again. Excellent. So we can start with a couple questions that got submitted uh, during the registration process. Uh, so Eric, the first one is, what are the prospective impacts or benefits to the department of funding the new engineering building and the associated timing? And then uh, along with that, how does the unit ops lab integrate with the new engineering building plans? Sure. So um, great set of questions. Uh, I think the best way to describe it is that, um, you know, our department has taken a, a multi-pronged approach to really uh, revolutionize and, and, and bring up to spec all of our instructional and research spaces. So this has been a long-term, by long-term, probably the last 10 years of consistent uh, renovation. And what I showed you today were two examples of it in the bioengineering laboratory, but also uh, the large instructional laboratory. So those large instructional laboratories will be the chemical engineering undergraduate laboratories moving forward. Uh, they're beautiful. They're, you know, they catch the eye, they're functional. Uh, they're gonna be in the current engineering hall. Okay, so those are not going to move into uh, a, a new, uh, College of Engineering building. We're also consistently renovating research in the instructional spaces uh, with an engineering hall. What the new College of Engineering building will do if it gets through the final stages of approval for anyone who's been following uh, that saga uh, is to allow us to really uh, expand our enterprise. So as we expand the number of faculty and the size of the department, the number of undergraduates and graduate students, that has a requirement of additional space. And so uh, CBE uh, will have a footprint in the new building, but the new building is multidisciplinary across the whole College of Engineering. So uh, researchers with, with like um, requirements uh, in terms of uh, utilities or specialized equipment will be housed in neighborhoods in the new building. We anticipate uh, several CBE faculty being in those neighborhoods. Excellent, thank you, Eric. Uh, an additional question that was submitted prior to the, uh, to the meeting today was, what is the department doing to increase university efforts in advancing climate-related technologies? All right, so that's a great question. And at, at the forefront of a lot of, uh, thought about what chemical engineers do. And uh, part of, of the, uh, the draw of chemical engineering in, in, in today's day and age for, for new incoming students is the fact that we do a ton of work in sustainability. Uh, and one of the examples of that is, is Professor George Huber uh, has a nationally funded center in plastic recycling. Uh, so Efforts like these, uh, new battery technologies and things like that, while not direct study of the climate, uh, obviously have impacts on societal goals in terms of, of uh, moderating our effects on, on climate and waste. Um, I mentioned Stiliana earlier uh, in, the, in the presentation today. She works on you know, modeling uh, the circular economy. So you start with some raw materials, you have a product, and do we just landfill the product after its lifespan or do we reuse that? And so she's really uh, involved in those spaces. So I would uh, say that we're very actively involved in those spaces. Um, and there may be new initiatives coming down from at the campus level where the campus itself uh, may have focused initiatives in sustainability and related topics. And so CBE would definitely be a part of that as well. Great. Um, those are all the questions that I've seen to this point. If there's people on the call that would like to just unmute and ask a question of either Rosie or Eric, feel free. Otherwise, again, feel free to drop those into the chat and we'll, we'll get everything answered.
Okay, well, I, I guess that represents the, the end of our Winter Town Hall today. As always, feel free to reach out with, with questions or thoughts. Uh, and I look forward to seeing everybody uh, sometime in late spring for another update. Thank you and have a great weekend. Thanks, you too.